This time on The Gadget Show, Otis and I face the daunting challenge of using the latest tech to take on the professionals at their own game. There's high-tech skating gadge, advanced boxing <laughs> fitness technology. And every choice I had to make. And then Otis goes head-to-head -head with soul diva Beverly Knight to see if he can beat her singing her own song on SingStar. Sometimes when I'm not that strong, I'm and as if that's not enough, she's back. Susie Perry! Yay! Susie Perry is back with us and lighting up the show with her top five gadget lights. Welcome to The Gadget Show, and yes, your eyes do not deceive you. <laughs> She's back, Susie Perry! Woo! On the sofa of tech, oh. where you belong, girlfriend. And we have missed you so much. I've missed your little cardigans, and your sparkly little jewellery, and your, your lovely hairstyle, and your long, lovely, slender uh, earrings. Stop. It's great to have you back. Do you know what? It's great to be back. I hated <laughs> lying in my bed feeling all poorly. You know, I missed the challenges. I missed the tech. Yeah. Gail did a fantastic she job. She was awesome. She really did. And I missed you. Oh, thank you so much, Susie. I love that. It's, it's sad that you have to get very, 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 very ill and stay off for like <laughs> ten weeks to realise that. But that is it's the conclusion that matters. Should we get on with the tech? All right. Okay. okay. This week on the challenge, we would like to find out how much cutting-edge technology can improve you with your pastimes and your sports. Lovely, yes. Uh, Otis and I were set the seemingly impossible task of going up against genuine professionals in a series of different disciplines. We had the tech that we hoped would give us the edge. For this challenge, we've been set four disciplines to compete against seasoned professionals and win. For each activity, we found a professional who's willing to let us... Take them on. <laughs> and my first challenge was inline skating against Jenna Downing, the 10 times British and 2008 world aggressive champion. So I had my work cut out if I was going to beat her. My skates are Seba FR1s. They're high end urban skates with mid sized wheels, giving the perfect balance between speed and maneuverability. The first event was a straight-up race, and I had a trick up my sleeve to make my skates go as fast as possible. For this part of the challenge, I'm going seriously technical with these Swiss ceramic bearings. Silicon nitrate ceramic balls inside these will supposedly give me the quickest ride possible. Jenna was wearing a pair of Fusion X5s. The wheels are bigger than her normal skates, which meant they should be faster, but she wasn't used to them, so I still had a good chance of beating her. The ceramic bearings I'd put in have much less resistance than standard metal ones. I could really feel the difference. Ah. Ow! As Jenna coasted home, I limped past the finish line. Oh my ass! First blood to the professionals. <sighs> ah! Someone get a bum doctor! <laughs> The second event was all about manoeuvrability, a slalom race between these helmets. But after seeing just how good Jenna was, we needed to give her a proper handicap. She's going to be riding Supreme Turbo 33 boots with Hyper Rollo wheels. They're not even inline skates, they're quads. Quads may be cool again, but for a pro like Jenna, they just didn't have the manoeuvrability she's used to. Jason Jenner, the course is laid out for you. OK. How are you feeling? Pretty, pretty confident. <laughs> Actually, I'm not. Jenna, how are you feeling? I'm feeling quite nervous because of these new skates that I've got. Well, Jenna, you're going to go first. Good luck. Three, two, one. <laughs> go on, Jenna! Off she goes. Good, Good start. start. Good, Good start. Woo! Woo! No, nice turn. Oh! She's lost it. Oh! She's taken out. She's got it. She's got it. She's got it. Go, go. Quick. Quick. Give it. Oh, there you go. You did the course. In 12.15 <laughs> seconds, but you did knock one out of the way. So that's a two-second penalty on top. So that makes your time 14.15 seconds. That's what you have to beat. Woo! In three, two, one. <laughs> Off he goes. Oh. It's not like he got as quick a start, but he's oh. moving in and out of the helmets a lot smoother. Oh, no. He's on his way back now. Hasn't messed up yet. Hasn't missed one. A bit more difficulty coming back. Oh. You made no errors on your way up and down. Yes. And 11.7 yeah. seconds well done, Jason Rowe! Yeah. Yeah. Oh. So, Jenna, how did you find the quads? I 
They weren't great at helping me manoeuvre around the helmets. I need something a bit quicker. The inline wheel layout of my skates simply offered much more manoeuvrability. So the challenge was finally balanced at one all with one event to go. But sadly, that was Jenna's speciality, aggressive or stunt skating. This time, Jenna chose the skates that we will both wear, Razor Icons 2. These aggressive skates have small flat wheels designed for grinding, jumping and spinning your way around a skate park. So I had the tech I needed to take on Jenna at her own game. Problem was, I had just 15 minutes to own some really impressive tricks. And I knew that only something really special was going to impress judge Steve Swain, the world number five aggressive skater. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> that grab showed just how comfortable I felt on the races. But for the honour of the gadget show, I needed to pull off a stunt that I'd never even landed before. A 360-degree spin. Yay! Woo! After my first ever 360, I was over the moon. I thought the combination of me and the tech stood a chance. Then I saw Jenna skate. <laughs> that was in 540! <laughs> that was seriously cool. OK, Steve, what did you think? Well, um, we've got to congratulate Jason. Absolutely brilliant, but in comparison to what Jenna did, no competition. For once, I absolutely agree. Well, you'd landed that 360, it was perfect. Jenna, so, I'm going to remember well those done. words for the rest of my <laughs> damn life. Now, that was a great challenge. Absolutely awesome. I was in my element, Susie. Can, can you believe imagine? it? Half a day doing nothing but inline skating with the world champion. Hey, and you did a 360. Susie, thank you so much. Admittedly, you had to measure it in millimetres. <laughs> but I was airborne. It's a life box ticked. And you won the uh, slalom as well. Yeah, I did. Although, you, all, all I'm going to say is it was my idea to put Jenna on quads, OK? That's all I'm saying. She was something else, though. You did have some tough competition yeah, there. Yeah, she was absolutely awesome. So, in that case, tech didn't help you beat a professional. Welcome back. Now, I want to talk to you about video blogging, or vlogging. Vlogging's basically a sort of video diary which you post onto the internet for anyone and everyone to see. It's become one of the best ways of letting the world know what you think about whatever you want. It costs peanuts to do, but gives you a potential worldwide audience running into hundreds of millions of people. But what's the best way to go about vlogging? Well, I've been doing some testing to find out. Vlogging or video blogging burst into popularity four years ago, the same year that saw the release of the iPod video, the launch of YouTube and broadband users overtaking dial-up users for the first time. Vloggers seized on these technological advances and were soon vlogging away at a rate of knots. But to create a vlog, you need two things, the right kit and the right forum. First, the kit, and I reckon a good, inexpensive solution is to use a webcam. Right, for my vlog, I've decided to do what so many vloggers do and simply face the camera and sound off about a personal bugbear. And the great thing about the world of vlogging is there's always someone out there willing to watch and listen. And I'm sure they'll be fascinated with my views on the frankly despicable treatment of our country's lovely 1970s architecture. My first contender was the Microsoft LifeCam Show with a magnetic stand and a noise-cancelling mic. Why is it that we hate our 1970s architecture so much? It's all too often regarded as horrible, ugly bits of concrete. The life cam was easy enough to set up, but it does have some very annoying niggles. Now, I'm trying to get a close-up picture of my beloved central library to cut into my vlog. Um, obviously, I could hold it up close to the camera. What I can't do, frustratingly, is zoom in, because though there are zoom buttons on the screen, they don't seem to work with this particular webcam. So, was the Microsoft webcam worthy of my vlog? I'm reviewing my efforts, and frankly, I'm a bit disappointed with the quality of the video. They talk on the box about HD optics, but actually the maximum resolution of the video you can record is a measly 800 by 600 pixels. Hmm, and it looks like it. 
Would my second option perform any better? I'd gone for the Philips Pro webcam with a 2 megapixel sensor. Now, the Philips does record in HD, but the frame rate drops so badly that I don't think you can actually follow anyone talking easily at this setting. So I'm going to go for one of the lower settings. The Philips comes with autofocus, digital face tracking. Next to that, we've got the Birmingham Central Library. Here it is. And an eight times digital zoom. Overall, the Philips is a real improvement over the Microsoft. You get better picture quality, better audio quality as well, and I prefer the more conventional clip stand. Although usable HD video would be nice. Finally, the Logitech QuickCam Sphere, which has a 2 megapixel sensor and a Zeiss lens, but surprisingly shoddy audio quality. Currently threatened with demolition and unlisted. The QuickCam software gives you a range of options. There's manual or autofocus and a motorised motion tracker, which is great for when you get really ranty. It's not fair. It's a tragedy waiting to happen. It's great that the Logitech records in HD, but it's really let down by its sound quality. It's fine if you're having a normal conversation. But hopeless if you're getting a rant on. So the Philips webcam took the prize in the first round with its superior picture and sound quality. After a quick bit of editing, my footage looked really sleek, but that was only half the job done. I still had to get my vlog online. But where do you post it? Well, lots of vloggers post to their own sites, but for a first timer seeking a big audience, which I am, it's a good idea to use a video sharing site. Again, I'm going to try out three of the most likely looking options to find out which one works best. YouTube is the most popular video sharing site with over 64 million videos. In fact, it's the third most popular site of any kind on the internet. This clearly gives you an advantage if you're trying to reach the biggest audience possible, but it's not all about the figures. You want it to be quick and easy too. YouTube accepts most major video formats and you can record straight from your webcam with quick capture, though the sync's rather sketchy to say the least. Now, about this 1970s architecture, we've already done it three times already, but I've got to do it again in case the message hasn't got home. Our second contender, Dailymotion.com, attracts fewer visitors than YouTube, but still plays host to a respectable 10 million videos. The upload process is nice and simple, and you can upload up to a maximum of 20 minutes of video at a time, rather than YouTube's 10, which could be useful for any longer rants that I might have. Daily Motion also has a rather better instant capture mode, and once your video's up there, it has a few nice tricks. If you want to do more than video sharing and actually embed your videos into your blog or your website, then Daily Motion offers lots of slick and good looking options. Finally, I looked at Blip.tv. This site allows you to upload your video with a variety of licensing options. It's a shame that Blip TV doesn't allow instant capture and upload from your webcam, but it does allow audio-only uploads, which could be useful. It doesn't pull as big an audience as the other two, although it still draws viewers in the millions, though it does offer your viewers a big incentive. Without any additional software, viewers can download your episodes and keep them. So, with Blip you can download, Daily Motion's great for embedding, but with YouTube's overwhelming popularity you get unbeatable audience figures and feedback. And it's our number one place to post your vlogs. OK, uh, G ratings mm. then for the webcams. Shall we start with Logitech? Yes, I think just two Gs for the Logitech. It was the most expensive of the webcams we looked at, and though it has some really nifty features, mm. it was uh, horribly let down by its sound quality. Yeah, promised, but mm. didn't really deliver, did it? Mm. OK, what about the Microsoft? Just about scrapes three Gs. I mean, the sound quality was better, and mm. it is much more reasonably priced, but the uh, picture quality was really rather mediocre, I thought. And finally, the Philips, which seemed to be head and shoulders above the other two. Definitely. Four Gs for the Philips, and it wasn't perfect. <laughs> It didn't deal with HD video that well, but overall, the sound and picture quality was by far the best of the three. So, the Gadget Show's favourite vlogging webcam is the Philips. Right, now it's time for the Wall of Fame. Each week on the Wall of Fame, Otis and I select a particular gadget category. We then decide on one example of a gadget from that category, which we feel deserves a place on the wall behind me. That's right. We make a case for each of our gadgets, but only Judge John Bentley can decide which of those gadgets go on the wall. And this week, whether they win or not, Jason and Otis are both guaranteed to clean up because it's a battle of the iconic vacuum cleaners. Hoover versus Dyson. Feet up, darling. I'm hoovering. 
No matter who makes your vacuum cleaner, you call it a Hoover. Mr. Hoover invented it. We all loved it. We all bought one, and the world has been a cleaner place ever since. Job done. Well, yes and no. You see, Mr. Hoover did put it into production, but the story's a little bit more complicated than that. The first ever portable electric vacuum cleaner was in fact invented in 1908 by a man called Murray Spangler. He was a shop cleaner who got a bit cheesed off with sneezing all the time because he had so much dust up his nasal passages. And so he invented a machine that looked a little bit like this. Bring it on, love. Thank you very much. Could you just clean the pipe out for us, would you, love? Thank you, yeah. Yeah, it was basically a box with a fan in it, a pillowcase and a bit of a wood handle. Switch it on, love. And amazingly, it worked. And thus, the first Hoover was made. Murray's cousin was married to a man called William Hoover. He was amazed by the design and promptly got into business with Spangler. So really, whenever we clean a house, we're not hoovering, we're Spangling. But it wasn't until after the Second World War that Hoovers went truly global, partly due to the rise in affluence in the West and the fact that these machines could be manufactured so cheaply. By the 60s, there was a vacuum cleaner in every home, and most of them were Hoovers. An incredible 60 million Hoovers have so far sold in the UK alone. The vacuum cleaner that clearly deserves to be on the wall of fame is the Hoover, because it was the pioneer. Anything else? He's just imitation. Imitation? I don't think so. There'll be no fans, pillowcases and broom handles here. Excuse me. <laughs> Thank you. The only vacuum cleaner that deserves to go on the Wall of Fame is the Dyson. The story is so much better too. No bloke called Spangler or complicated mergers, just a British inventor called James Dyson. He drove past an industrial dust extractor at a sawmill and immediately thought, that's my new Hoover. In the industrial dust extractor, centrifugal forces separate dust from air. Some filters then clean the air before it comes back out again. The dust stays inside. I've no idea how that happens, but what matters is that in 1993, after 5,127 prototypes, the very first Dyson, the DC-01, was born. You need never change a bag again. Hoovers suddenly looked very old-fashioned. And it's not just its consistently hard-sucking, bagless nature that merits it a place on the wall. James Dyson himself is a bit of a legend having the type of commitment and perseverance that made Britain great. He's still refining the design with common sense ideas like the ball, which makes cornering easier. You could go as far as saying that Dyson's were style icons. This baby here did the whole see-through plastic thing in 97, a year before the first iMac, which goes some way to explaining why, despite being a little bit pricey, after just two years, the Dyson was the UK's best-selling vacuum cleaner. Owning one gave you bragging rights in front of your neighbours, a bit like having a relative who had got into Oxford University. International sales now total over £5 billion, and while other companies were initially dismissive, the boss of Hoover has admitted that he now wishes he'd taken the technology himself. They even ended up in court for patent infringement. I know what John will say. It's just an upgrade on a Hoover. It's an improvement on a legend, not a legend in itself. <laughs> Whatever. You need to think about the long term, John. Just because it wasn't the first doesn't mean that this baby isn't the best. Hmm, this is a difficult decision. It's a difficult decision. Excuse me, I'm just going to do a bit of hoovering while you think about it. Something mundane turned exciting versus just being able to do it at all being a revolution. Mm. Sexy new revolution. And in this case, it's going to be... The Dyson. It's yes! going to be the one. It's going yes! to be the one that takes no! it to Europe. Dyson power. Because it is almost the definition of a gadget. It is useful. Yet it really makes that utility into an entertainment by being such a good piece of design. And I think that it really has to have a place on the wall of fame. Welcome back. Some more tech now because it's time for another one of our top fives. And this week, I'm rather hoping that it leaves you feeling illuminated because here are our top five gadget lights. Lights. What would we do without them? 
Well, for one thing, our nocturnal gadget-fueled lifestyle would be seriously cramped if we could only work during the hours of daytime. For years, lights have been very untechy and, well, let's be honest, a bit boring. But all that has changed. And now there are stacks of gadget lights that do so much more than brighten your room. So here are my top five gadgety lights. In at number five for its multitasking ability is the solar light cap. By day, this rather fetching little number is a good shield against the midday sun. But at night, it's got its own little secret. It's a torch. And even better, it doesn't need batteries. Solar panels capture the power of the sun so that at night, the two super bright LEDs can run for up to five hours continuously. Now, they're controlled by a microchip, which means you don't just get one mode, because if I hold my thumb down, the light dims. Now, if I double click, you get party mode. Oh, yeah! My number four is light spray glow graffiti. Make your house urban without leaving a trace. Now, this is really cool. With this glow graffiti, I can make my words glow in the dark. This is a specially treated sheet that, when hit by the UV light of my spray can, will turn my little design green. Move the can closer to the material to make a brighter, smaller point and further away to make a wider, gentler glow. So, brilliant for parties, but be careful who you invite, otherwise it might get out of hand. Illuminating our lives at number three is Glow Flow. Finally, some cool lighting for your bathroom. Bath and shower times are nearly always gadget free, but fortunately, Glow Flow changes all that. Turning your shower on and off activates and deactivates the LED. And the magic here is that it doesn't need batteries. The LED lights are illuminated by the force of the water running through it. There's a temperature sensor built in too, glowing blue when the water is cool and red when the water is warm. Just missing out on the top spot, in at number two, is the Amp Lamp. This is the Amp Lamp, and it's designed by top lighting designer Dominic Bromley. And it looks beautiful, but that's not why it's in our top five. It's not called the Amp Lamp for nothing, because incorporated into this design is an amplifier and a speaker. Hidden behind the shade is the speaker. A high-quality transparent NXT panel, which, combined with a vertical subwoofer and an air sound driver, creates a full 360-degree sound. So, it looks good and it sounds great. And unlike a lot of other gadgets that try multifunction, this actually does it beautifully. So, our number one has to be really special, and it is... Flatlight. It's the world's longest, thinnest energy-saving light bulb. Flatlight doesn't use a normal light bulb, so it hasn't got a delicate filament to break. Instead, it's got these tiny phosphor crystals which illuminate when you put electricity through them. It costs only a fraction of what a traditional light bulb would cost to rent, and it's even more energy efficient than fiber optics or LEDs. But much cooler than that is it's only half a millimetre thick and it's completely flexible. So a whole world of lighting possibilities awaits. Great top five, Suze. I particularly like this, the flat light. I knew you would. What would you use it for? Um, well, on a consumer level, think about it around kitchen units, for example, drawers. So you don't have enough light to read a book by, but you can certainly see everything defined in I a dark I love this. So you just define the edges of a mirror or, exactly. or put it underneath a, bre a breakfast bar. Completely. It's yeah. like a nice design feature as well. No, it's awesome. It? Or emergency exits, that kind of stuff. Right, now it's time to return to this week's big challenge. Yes, you'll remember that Jason and I are taking on a professionals at their own game, using the latest tech in an attempt to give us the upper hand. Yeah, in the first part it was me versus Jenna Downing, ten times British inline skating champion and current reigning world champion. And I was beaten. It's funny you should <laughs> use the word beaten, Jason, because uh, the second challenge is down to me, and I knew from the start it was going to hurt. The inline skating challenge didn't quite pan out as we'd hoped, and our pro versus amateur challenge was only going to get harder. This is the gym where Ricky Hatton trained, and it's a location for the second part of our Pro-Am Challenge. Yeah, and Otis is fighting, and I do mean fighting, for the Gadget Show's honour. But like you did earlier, I do have tech on my side. Otis's opponent was Tony Jaffa Jeffries. He won an Olympic bronze medal in Beijing and then turned pro. He's a super middleweight fighter with an enviable win record, so Otis wasn't going to be pulling any punches. 
Although I fancy myself as a bit of a potential kung fu master, I'm not too sure my <laughs> skills are going to help me much in this no, prize fight. Don't worry, because you've got plenty of opportunities. You've got two challenges with Tony. Right. So, you better start, as all good fighters start. Change your clothes. <gasps> yeah. Right. All too soon, it was time for round one with Tony. And the first bout was with top boxing tech, Slam Man. Slam Man is a computerised fight trainer. Lights on various parts of the body light up and you have to strike them. Afterwards, the computer calculates your punch rate. Built for home fitness training, Slam Man was about to take the beating of its life. The challenge, to punch out as many lights in a minute as possible. All right, Tony, you're up first. You ready? Yeah. OK. Good luck. As soon as one light is out, the next one lights up, so the faster you can accurately punch, the higher the score. Oh, ow! Eek. That looks painful. Speed of those jabs, Otis. Yeah. I'm a little bit worried now. <laughs> I'm a bit worried. Oh, he's done in the old double triple, the oh, old whip, triple whammy, ten seconds to the go. Beast. And out comes the power from the gloves of Tony. And he's done it. Up the Time is up, my friend. And you have the very impressive score of 90 punches. Absolutely beautiful performance, right. With a frankly daunting score to beat, it was Otis's time to face the slam man. Nice, good start. <laughs> <laughs> this kit turns keeping fit into a game, constantly challenging you to beat your last high score. And it's great for getting some aggression out too. Three seconds to go, Otis. Keep it going, my friend. Keep it going. There you go. You've done it. And at the end of that, <laughs> 66, 66 hits versus Tony's 90. 90. Tony wins round one. OK, look, you did fantastically well Thanks. in round one. You got pipped at the post by yes. Tony. Yeah. We now move into round two, which actually involves going into the ring. I've seen him training. I'm a little bit concerned. Jason, don't worry. Don't worry. I've got high gear, used by law enforcement, the military and mixed martial artists. Whatever he's got, I've got it covered. This body armour is a combination of smart foams, plexiglass and plastic, and it only weighs a featherweight 3.75 kilos. <laughs> that feels good. OK, you're looking good. The final challenge was the biggie. Otis going head-to-head -head with Olympic medalist Tony in the ring. Seconds out! For the final round, in you go. It was obvious that there was no way he was going to win in a straight fight. So my challenge was to see if the armour would protect me enough to survive the round. Oh, this is doing all right. I'm quite impressed. Three blows, out. This is what you've got to get, my friend. Woo! <laughs> But to actually win the bout, Otis needed not only to survive, but land three good punches on Tony within one minute. Although I was getting a pasting, High Gear's high-tech construction was absorbing Tony's power. The impact-resistant plastic plate and the energy-absorbing smart foam meant that while I could still feel each punch, they just didn't hurt. You've only got ten seconds left, did it? I think that's one hit, Otis. Come on, you're gonna get two more. Keep focus. <laughs> okay, hold it there, hold it there, boys. Hold it there. Great, great fight, both of you. Get over there, my friend. Get it there, get it there. Oh, how did it feel inside the suit? Okay, that's okay. You don't have to speak sign language. Was it okay? Was it okay? It was great, man. That was, that was really good fun. <laughs> you did get at least one hit on him. OK. A couple of very fine glancing blows, but I've got to say that the winner, by, without a shadow of a doubt, <laughs> is Tony! Thanks very much, Tony, man. Thank you. That, my friend, was one tough challenge. Yes, indeed. Tony Jeffries was laughing at you in the No, ring. no, no. We were laughing together, actually. Oh. It's only because I was wearing the mask you, can, <laughs> you couldn't see me smiling. You took a panding, though, so how, how do you feel about this kit here? I could feel... I could feel the force of each punch, but not the pain. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. OK. Uh, are you actually wearing anything underneath that? I'm, I'm wearing my socks. Ooh. Jason Bradbury! <sighs> I'm sorry, you know, it's all... It's really professional. <laughs> <laughs>
Welcome back. Now it's time to return to the final part of this week's big challenge. Now you'll remember that these two are using technology to take on the professionals. Yeah. And so far, it's fair to say, it hasn't really gone very well. In hey? fact, they've been a bit rubbish. Oh, Susie, what? come on. Hmm? Having said that, it's a pretty accurate portrayal of my uh, display on my rollerblades. <laughs> I mean, I had some fun, but Jenna, the professional inline skater, was amazing. Yeah. And I did take a physical pounding from Tony. I mean, a proper, actual you got pasted. beating. Yeah, yeah, so you, you were a bit rubbish. Fair enough. Okay. Yeah, I, I so the question that. is, can these two, in the final part of the challenge, actually salvage any gadget show pride whatsoever? Yeah. So this is all about finding out just how accurate dance and karaoke computer games are using these two gamers against the professionals. So can the games actually recognise true talent? Or... Us. Is the winning in learning how to play the game. Our Pro vs Amateur Challenge was entering its final round, but it was looking decidedly one-sided. We're going to be OK. I feel very confident because as we move into the last two challenges, we've got video games on our side. Right. Yeah? And if yeah. we can't beat the professionals with video games, yeah. we can't beat the professionals. This challenge was about testing if our supreme gaming skills would be enough to beat the professionals' honed talent. Today's consoles allow you to be anything from a rock god to a snowboard dude. With innovative ways of interaction making the games properly physical. And what could be more physical than Dancing Stage Universe 2 for the Xbox 360? I was up first against Zanel Fontaine. At 11, he's already a national street dance champion. And our challenge, a head-to-head -head dance mat duel. Highest score wins. OK, Zanel, you're up first. Okay. Please take your place on the mat and get ready to bust a move. With games like this, rhythm is key. Following the on-screen instructions exactly and stepping on the right pads at the right time is the only way to rack up points. The more moves you string together perfectly, the higher your score. And Zanel's dancer's instincts didn't let him down. That was an eight-move combo. <laughs> Look at this. He's got a 13 point combo. 14 combo. No way. <laughs> Look, he's clapping as well. He's even clapping. <laughs> 53,099,373. Somebody write that down, cos I'm going to forget million? it. 53 million? Jason. Yeah. Are you ready to take your place? I am. Man. I'm inspired by you. I am. Never discount the old man. Cap. On the tilt, and I'm ready to get my funk on. I'm doing this for the 80s, all right? Zanel might be good, but I still had a chance. As long as I could stay exactly in sync, moving when the game's on-screen arrows hit their target, I wouldn't get marked down for my old-school moves. King top, baby! <laughs> but would it be enough to beat Zanel? <laughs> Okay, no! Million speed, Jason. 39 million! 39,125,814 no! meaning! No! Zanel oh. has won the no! dance challenge! Well done, son, well done! With Jason soundly beaten by an 11-year-old, the task of clawing back some honour for the gadget show fell to me. But I wasn't going to dance. Oh, no, I was going to sing. Every console now has a karaoke game, but the undisputed daddy and the one we chose is SingStar for the PlayStation. Now, I'm a bit of a legend when it comes to SingStar. I rarely lose, and I've chosen one of my favourite songs. In fact, there's only one thing standing in the way of my victory. That is the person who wrote and sings the song, Beverly Knight. Beverly Knight is a soul diva extraordinaire, and Otis's challenge was to beat her at her own game. Well, almost. A sing-star sing-off with one of Beverly's greatest hits, Shoulda, Woulda, Coulda. Oh, it's need I impress on you the importance of this final stage of the challenge. I understand. Now, I know that you basically love Beverly. I'm a massive fan. I Thank know that. You. And, and right now, Beverly's the enemy and you've got to slam down. Right. <laughs> Sorry, Beverly, we're not yeah. making you feel very welcome, are we? No, but that's all right. Good, because we're trying to put you off. <laughs> Perfect. But it's so not going to work. I know, I know it. I'm so going to smash it. Well, here you are. You grab the mic. I shall indeed. And you take your place in the SingStar Zone. 
People say that together we were both sides of the same coin. That we would shine like Venus in a clear night sky. Beverly sounded great, but in SingStar that's simply not enough because you have to stick exactly to the notes the game expects to rack up the points. For compromise. Ad-libbing, however good it sounds, isn't going to increase your score. Too late to realize how far apart we grown and how I wish I wish I done all it. And what Beverly hadn't realized was that Singstar doesn't always use the radio edits of songs. So this version of her track took her by surprise. Can't change your mind. Don't know what I could have And that small mistake may have been enough to give me the edge. This is this is where I could get in. Oh my. That was fantastic. 6,362 points! Beverly Nye, ladies and gentlemen! It may be her song and her profession, but Singstar is my game. People say that together we were both sides of the same coin. That we should shine like Venus in the clear night sky. Oh, nice! We thought our love could overcome the circumstances. Oh, it's got voice but my voice. ambition wouldn't allow for compromise. Even though I knew exactly what the game wanted, I couldn't help but show off to Beverly. Shoulda, woulda, coulda, all the last words of a fool if I would not forsake the opportunities of fate. I know I'm right where I belong, but sometimes when I'm not that strong, I wish I... <laughs> I still thought I had a good chance of winning. Change your mind. Oh, oh, so oh. Otis did brilliantly, but he missed out on the goal by a mere 320 points. <laughs> you can sing, though. In all seriousness, you can sing. Thank you very much. Although you did so well, it does mean that yet again we have lost to the professional, Miss Beverly Knight. Beats getting punched in the face. Yeah. Wow. I really enjoyed that challenge. Bev Knight, Sing Star Superstar. She is indeed. Just... And what about his wall bling? Yeah, that was it fantastic. Was. How yeah. impressive was that? Her voice is here. However, the software still recognised, despite Beverly's mistake, that she was the superior singer, and that's why she was. Which is a vindication of computer gaming. Yeah. Once again, as a big computer gaming fan, I'm, I'm so pleased that the computer games have proved so realistic. Mm. Well, that was my question going into it. Are they very accurate? Well, I think so, because Beverly, um, respect to you, you did a great job, but she's a professional singer. She won. Um, my dancing opponent was clearly a better mover. He moved so well, mm. the software represented that. I don't know about the excuses, though, for the inline skating and the boxing. That was, <laughs> that was maybe our <laughs> bad. It was a whitewash, chaps, it's fair to say. Best part of yeah. today's show, though, however, <laughs> has been having Susie back. Oh, thank you very much. It is Susie. Very nice to be back. You Come were meant to be on a this. A big group, love. Big red couch. We'll see you all next see time. See you next week.